Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. We love you, adore you. We bow down before you. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. Son of God, what a wonder you are. Son of God, what a wonder you are. You cleansed my soul from sin, sent the Spirit within. Son of God, what a wonder you are. Holy Spirit, what a comfort you are. Holy Spirit, what a comfort you are. You lead us, you guide us, you live right inside us. Holy Spirit, what a comfort you are. We want to thank you for your presence this morning and so glad that you're here. And if we have visitors, we want you to know that you're welcome and we hope that you will feel welcome. After our morning worship, uh, just this reminder, uh, we'll have a fellowship meal and everyone's invited. If you haven't brought anything, that doesn't matter. There's always plenty. I want to read a, one verse from chapter 12 of Romans. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Would you pray with me? Our Holy Father in heaven, what a wonder you are. We appreciate you for the things that you've done for us. We appreciate you because you are the author of our salvation. We appreciate you because you've given us life. We appreciate you because we know that you are the creator of all things. And it is our prayer this morning that our worship to you will be pleasing and acceptable. And we pray that you'd help us to live lives that would reflect the life of Jesus and forgive us when that has not been the case. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy and it's because of your mercies that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. We thank you for the promise of your presence as we worship you. We thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made and the confidence that we have knowing that his blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. This is our prayer this morning as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow our path that the master has trod. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Tolling on, tolling on, tolling on, tolling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the master comes. To the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed. To the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and his banner, our glory will be. While we herald the tidings, salvation is free. Tolling on, tolling on. Tolling on, tolling on, let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the master comes. To the work, to the work, there is labor for all, for the kingdom of darkness and error shall fall. And the name of Jehovah exalted shall be in the loud swelling call. A salvation is free. Tolling on, tolling on, tolling on, tolling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the master comes. Far and near the fields are teeming with the waves of ripened grain. Far and near their gold is <coughs> o'er the sunny slope and plain. Lord of harvest, send forth reapers here. Us, Lord, to Thee we cry. Send them now, the sheaves, to gather ere the harvest time pass by. Send them forth with morn, first beaming, send them in the noontime's glare. When the sun's last rays are gleaming, bid them gather Today I'll be reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 41. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 41. When the Lord, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. We'll be singing this song in preparation for the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> we'll sing all the verses in the chorus at the end. <clears throat> they bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They fed him through the streets in shame. They sped upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the King. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful Mac of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. This beautiful Lord's Day morning, we have the honor and the privilege and the commandment to partake of the Lord's Supper, to do this in remembrance of him, to remember the sacrifice that he made for us, but more than that, to remember the love that he has for all of us, that it's lasted 2,000 years since he offered himself up, since he shed his blood, that it still has the power to heal us of our sins. I'd like to read from the book of Luke, chapter 28, or I'm sorry, 22, verses 19 through 20. 
And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we thank you so much for this day and for this opportunity to gather around this table to partake of the bread that is the body of your Son offered up on the cross for us. We pray, Father, that we do this in a manner that is pleasing to you and beneficial to us. We ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Pray. God and our Father, we continue our thanks for you to you for the cup that is the blood of Christ offered up on the cross for our sins. We pray to you, Father, that you would bless this cup and bless us as we partake of it. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. As a matter of convenience, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we have this opportunity to lay by in store as we have prospered. To pray with me, please. Our God and our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we recognize you as our creator and that all of our blessings come from you. That all the good things in this life are because you love us. You have prospered us in many ways, Father, and we take this opportunity to return a portion of that to you. We ask you to bless it and bless us as we do this. We ask this Christ. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Let's stand for this next song, if you're able. <clears throat> when the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear. If my heart is right when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. If my robe is white when he calls me, if my robe is white, I will hear. If my robe is white when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Please be seated. Good morning. I hope you have your Bibles. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. As you're turning over to that passage, let me uh, mention just a couple of things. We do have our fellowship meal immediately after our morning worship. If you were unable to bring anything, let me assure you that we will have more than enough for everyone. And we would just encourage everyone to stay for that meal. And we'll have a devotional in the fellowship hall, and then our services will be dismissed for tonight. Also want to mention that next Sunday is the first of three baby showers that are going to be taking place over the next several weeks. Uh, Brooke and Tim, everybody uh, raise your hands up for a moment. Everybody look right there at the back, okay? Right there at Tim and Brooke. They have little Addie and they're bringing a little brother into this world. I can't think of anything better than on all three showers beginning with this young couple. We could call you young, can't we? That is going to be a beautiful way to encourage them. And we hope that you'll be here at 2 o'clock next Sunday to encourage uh, that family. Also want to mention that on March the 3rd, I accidentally told Karen March the 2nd, but on March the 3rd, we have another youth night. It's going to be at the Southwest Congregation in Oklahoma City. And we hope that many will be able to attend. And then on March the 2nd that you've been seeing in the bulletin, we're going to have a seminar over in Oklahoma City where they'll be bringing in speakers from the area and really across uh, a number of states. So we hope that many people will have an opportunity to attend a few of those lectures and then we'll also be able to be at that second baby shower for the Deathridge family. Well, this morning I want to begin with a couple of questions. And this is the first. Who influenced you to become a follower of Jesus Christ? Lily Baker. Lily Baker. Maybe some would say it was my mom. 
It was my dad. It was one of my grandparents. Maybe it was one of your Bible school teachers. Maybe it was a coach at the school. Someone significant in your life. This question you've definitely heard before. Where did your baptism take place? There's a number of you in this room. Your baptism took place behind that big screen. And there are also quite a few of you in this room that were baptized in the fellowship hall, not in the kitchen sink, <laughs> but in a baptistry that was there. And if you have some pictures, I would love to see it because I'm still trying to envision if they had stairs going up into the baptistry, how that all looked in that kitchen area. Some of you, I can think of at least one person uh, that's not here today, that's with the Lord, they were baptized in a hot tub. I can think of a few people that were baptized in a uh, swimming pool. And I would dare to say there are some in this room that have been baptized out at Lariat Creek Christian Camp. And they now have two baptistries where those baptisms take place. Well, I've said all of that for a reason. Because Acts chapter 8 is a beautiful story. And as we talk about this familiar story, I want you to see that it was about God searching for an Ethiopian. And I want you to see from the end to the very beginning, it all centers around Jesus Christ and about being baptized. But really this passage comes with a warning. And it's a warning that we really could put up every Sunday, but especially for today. Don't let the familiarity of this passage rob you of its joy. So I want to begin in Acts chapter 8 in verse 26. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Luke writes, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was on his way home, sitting in his chariot, reading from Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading from Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come and to sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Verse 34. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. You know, as I think about this very familiar passage, there are really four phrases that really rise to the surface as we think about this story. And the first one you see behind me on the big screen is the soul winner. The soul winner. The person that we're speaking about is Philip. And I want to remind you that according to Acts chapter 6... 
He was one of the seven that was chosen to help in a very important need when it came to the distribution of goods to the widows. I also want to remind you that in Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, Philip is referred to as the evangelist. Now what I want you to also see is that Philip was engaged in a great work in Samaria. And I want you to look back just a few verses. And I want you to see in Acts 8 and verse 4 it states... Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And then I want you to jump down to the end of verse 10 and into verse 11 where it states, And they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And they were baptized both men and women. Verse 13, Simon himself believed and was baptized. So I want us to think about some geography. And this is geography that you know pretty well. Now here we've got Philip is doing all of the teaching and the preaching in Samaria. You know from Bible classes and when James was here and when I was here in the past and now back in the present that we've always got Galilee in the north... Samaria here in the middle, and we've got Judea here in the south. God is using Philip in a very profound way. Many people are being taught the gospel, preaching Jesus, and they were baptized. And then we find that the Lord specifically, and I want you to see this again, specifically he is told from an angel in verse 26, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then in verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So think about this as you, as you look at this geography. Here you've got a preaching and teaching in Samaria to a large group of people. And now God, through an angel of God and the spirit, they want... Philip to leave the work here in Samaria and he wants him to go south to Jerusalem and to go south from Jerusalem to Gaza. So here if, if we were looking at this map we've got him here, here we've got Jerusalem and he wants him to come all the way down here to Gaza. Now I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. All of the fighting that's been taking place with Israel it is all in the Gaza Strip. And one of those places would have been the city of Gaza. So as you think about that, there's a couple of things at least that come to my mind. You would think it would be easier if the Spirit or the angel of the Lord or if God himself would have told this Ethiopian what they needed to do in order to become a Christian. But God didn't work that way. He wanted to use Philip. And as we think about this community, and as we think about north to Gary and south to Binger, as we think about west to east, God wants to use you just like he wants to use me to bring people to Jesus Christ. That's why he's left us here. He wants us to be his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece. But I think it's also interesting to point out as we think about this individual Philip, this soul winner, that God wants him to take this desert road, this deserted road that would go down once again south from Jerusalem down to Gaza. A deserted road, a wilderness road. I was thinking this week about something maybe that would be an example and I thought about Route 66. Now with the exception of the Wilhoites, and the Heldermans, if you're going to Weatherford, you probably don't necessarily use Route 66. You probably use Highway 40. I could tell you when we had all that construction, don't you hate that word construction on I-40 in particular? And I hate to tell you this, it's coming back sometime soon, okay? It's coming closer, all right? 
I told my father-in-law, don't, don't come down I-40 when all the construction was taken. Take 66 out of El Reno. Well, that was, I thought, a good suggestion, except some trucks. Do you remember when they put down the rocks? His window ended up getting chipped, okay? So he would say, don't use Route 66 if you're coming from uh, El Reno down to Hinton during that construction period. But isn't it interesting that God wanted him to come south out of Jerusalem to Gaza? He doesn't tell him why. He just tells him to do it. And he obeys. But not only do we hear about Philip, but we see this seeker. And I think it's interesting to point out in what we read just a moment ago, he is an Ethiopian eunuch that has gone to Jerusalem to worship and now he is on his way home. That is why I have some show and tell up here. And I want to show you a little bit more geography. Have you ever thought about this? What book follows Revelation? What book follows Revelation? It's the book of maps. The book of maps, okay? Now, I want you to look at this map, and I've got a better one that I want to show you. But here we've got the Gaza Strip up here in Israel, and we have this seeker, this Ethiopian, that has come from the country of Ethiopia. We're talking about over a thousand miles he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Can you imagine that? And as you think about Africa in particular, Carla and I have had several individuals from Ethiopia sit at our dining room table when we were living in Stillwater. Students at the university. Oklahoma State, many years ago, started a college in Ethiopia. And just before we moved here, I did the funeral for one of our members that was one of the lead professors in starting that institution. As you think about Africa, I also thought about where James is going to be going in the next four to five weeks. He'll be going to South Africa. A great work that we've been supporting for many years with the African Bible School. And then as I think specifically about some friends that Carla and I have, we have some dear friends from Ghana and Nigeria. They were here just a few weeks ago, and they brought us some presents. These are homemade shirts. Now, you could tell. Do you think these are for Carla or for myself? Okay. And I'm glad I'm a little skinnier. They always make things kind of tight-fitting, okay? Uh, they made these shirts in Ghana and brought them over here to the United States. Carla has a dress. That, uh, that she will show sometime that came all the way from Ghana. So I want you to think about this. Here you've got an Ethiopian who has come from another country nearly more than thousands of miles away to come to worship in Jerusalem. But there's a couple other things that I want to mention about him. He was a eunuch. In other words, he could not father children. In the heathen world of that day, a man was made a eunuch if he had charge of a harem. The leaders believed that that kind of man could be trusted around all of those other women. Now, over the course of time, those men who were eunuchs were elevated to other kinds of roles. And one of them was to be a treasurer. And what this eunuch was, this Ethiopian eunuch, he was in charge of the treasury of Candace. He was the secretary of their finances. Now I brought a little more show and tell this morning. I have a, uh, a $5 bill and I've got a $1 bill. Is there, uh, is there anyone that would like to come to the front and uh, read something off of these two bills? Okay, Karsten, come up, come up here. Have we got one more person? Well, you came last time. <laughs> Cassidy's going to come up here. Now, I did not bring a coin, so I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to be a little prejudiced. I'm going to let I'm going to let Cassidy win the five, and you can have the one. Okay, 
I want you to read what is in the, on the bottom of this bill. Can you read that to everybody? Like, yep, right there. Like the name or the thing below it? Underneath it, and then see if you can make out the name. Secretary of the Treasury, and I, I don't even know if that's even letters or not. It, it, you just, I cannot read his name, but say that again. What did you read? Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary of the Treasury, and it mentions a person's name. Then I want you to read this. What do you find right there? The very small print. Stephen. T. T. Mansion. You can read his. Look at this, Cassidy. You can read his because he actually printed it. He didn't sign it. And what's underneath Stephen Mansion's name? Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary of the Treasury. Let's give these young boys a hand. Okay, you can you can keep those. That is exactly that is exactly what that Ethiopian eunuch was. He was the Secretary of Treasury. Now here's two other things I think are very important. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 1. A eunuch was not allowed to go into the court of Israel to worship. The closest he could get to that center of worship was the court of the Gentiles. Now, this is a terrible example, but I thought about Kirk and Sherry. Not that you guys are bad examples. <laughs> but I also thought about C.D. and Sue. Just this morning, I'm meeting Chris again for the first time and his family and Brenda. We've got families that have come from Tuttle, from Weatherford, and from El Reno. Can you imagine driving that 25 to 45 to 50 minutes to come here this morning only to be able to get to the foyer? You're not allowed into the auditorium. The foyer is as close as you could come. Now, if you continue to come Sunday after Sunday, only come to the foyer, I would say we would really talk about your dedication and commitment and loyalty. Think about this Ethiopian eunuch. He had traveled over a thousand miles and the closest that he could get to worshiping God was to the court of the Gentiles. You know, when I was at Oklahoma Christian, my Greek teacher, Lauren Giger, who is still living, wife has passed away, he pointed this out to me. Because he had what we believe was the scroll of Isaiah, because he was reading out of Isaiah chapter 53, Lauren Giger said, I wonder if he'd ever looked at Isaiah chapter 56. Now, I'm not going to read from Isaiah chapter 56, but I want you to go back and look at that later this afternoon because it talks about a time when the eunuchs would be able to experience true salvation. That there was a time during that Jewish time that they could not come into the court of Israel. But a time was coming when they would have something far better than ever producing a son or a daughter. And it would be salvation. So here as you think about Philip and as you think about this seeker, one of the first things that you find in a lesson that you see behind me on the big screen is he asks him a question. And I want you to see this again in verse 30. Look at verse 30. Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. Now, I don't want you to think about the eunuch being like Ben-Hur in, in that old movie from years ago. Probably this chariot was more like a wagon. It could maybe go 10 to 15 miles a day. He didn't travel quickly. It was a slow process to get back to his home. And you've got Philip that comes up beside him, and instead of speaking to him, he asks him a question. I've mentioned this book before, but my dad gave me this book some time ago, and it's entitled, Doesn't Hurt to Ask. Do you know what the premise of the entire book is? Stop telling people what they need to hear and start asking questions. I'm halfway through the book. Need to finish this book. 
And he speaks specifically to preachers and to teachers. Ask more questions. And that's exactly what Philip does. He asks him the question, do you understand what you're reading? But there's a second answer and a second lesson there as you think about verse 31. And it's when he says to him, how can I unless someone explains it to me? As a group of individuals and as believers today, let's listen to what people say. You know, I was so embarrassed... I don't want to say who, but I was at the funeral for Karen Scotts and uh, Yvonne's relative, Freddie McCathrin, and one of our own introduced me to someone at the funeral. I wasn't listening because the next day, this church member said, in front of this person, tell me who this is. And he he could tell I had a, a strange look in my eyes, okay? The deer in the headlight look, okay? I thought it was Robbie or Ronnie, but I was too worried to, to, to say what, it, what I thought it could have been. And I said, I just don't know. Well, it was Ronnie. I, I, should, have, I should have said one of those two. You know, as preachers and as teachers and as students and as individuals, when 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 we're talking with people or when we're being introduced, do you know what there's a real temptation to do? Think about the next thing you're going to say. We want to listen. And Philip did a really good job at that. But I think there's a third lesson. And we need to remember that people are not the interruptions. You maybe have the rest of today planned out. You've maybe got your, your workspace planned out for tomorrow. And as someone comes into your life, sometimes we have created so much busyness in our life that we forget that Jesus' whole ministry was centered in interruptions. Think of the times that he's teaching and healing someone and he gets interrupted and he still wants to help and to do. Well, as we think about this story, we think about the Ethiopian's response. And his response was, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And he invited Philip up into his chariot. And don't you know that they are in Isaiah chapter 53? Roger, I appreciate your words today around the Lord's Supper. How many times around the Lord's Supper... Do we typically use 1 Corinthians 11 or do we use Isaiah chapter 53? Brothers and sisters in Christ, this was not an accident. This was not coincidence. This was God's plan. Reading from Isaiah chapter 53 about Jesus, a prophecy some seven to eight hundred years earlier that had now been fulfilled through Christ himself. It reminds me a little bit of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 when he says, we are here to know what God wants us to do. And you find the model message. Why didn't he use Matthew or Mark or Luke or John? They hadn't been put on paper yet. So what did Philip do? And I love verse 35. And if you like to underline in your Bibles, underline this. Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Amen? He told him about Jesus. And you think about what he talked to him about Jesus and about his life. You go back like we did earlier. Whenever you talk about Jesus, you must talk about baptism. Well, someone says, but it, it didn't say anything about him teaching him about baptism. His question was, why shouldn't I be baptized? In order to ask the question, something was said about baptism when he talked about Jesus Christ. I think that it's also very important to show that this man didn't know a lot of theology. He probably didn't know everything there was to know about the Old Testament. And there's a lesson there for each of us. 
I wonder sometimes if we've made the plan of salvation far too complicated. Or if we've come across to people that you've got to know this and this and this about worship and about ministry and about overseers and about deacons before we ever get to the most important place, which is about Jesus and becoming one of his children. This man knew one thing. I'm a sinner. And I need to become a child of the king. And every time you look at the conversion stories in the book of Acts, you see that they want to do it right away. What this man did fits with Mark 16 and verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. It fits with Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It fits with Galatians chapter 3 and 26 and 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. And I want you to look at what this man does. The Ethiopian sees water as they're making that trek down to Gaza, south out of Jerusalem. And he says, why shouldn't I be baptized? And according to verse 38, he gave orders to stop the chariot. And Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. There were more people than just Philip and the eunuch. He gave orders for the chariot to be stopped. There were others and at least one that was with them in that chariot. What a beautiful picture of them stopping, getting out of that chariot and going down into the water and Philip baptizing him. And the last thing that we see about this Ethiopian, as you think about these clothes from Africa, is that he went on his way rejoicing. Do you remember the day of your baptism? Do you remember how happy you were? Do you remember the gratitude? You are just as much saved today as you were when you became a child of the king. If you're walking in the light. Well, I think there are two applications. And on those applications, this is the first one. I need to look in. Almost done, okay? We need to look in. And we need to ask ourselves these questions. Was I old enough when I was baptized? Second, did I understand what I was doing? Maybe one of you are saying, but what do you mean by that? This is the answer. Did you understand that you were a sinner? Did you understand that you were outside of Christ? Were you old enough to, to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Were you old enough to be able to understand I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn my life around. Did you understand what you're doing? And were you immersed? You know, back on this other screen, every time that you see that word baptism, the Greek word is baptizo. It means immersion. Every time you see the word baptism, it means immersed. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Were you immersed into water? Sometimes we wonder about a spouse or a child or a sibling that has passed on. Listen. Listen. They're in God's hands. We are not the judge. These are words for the living. And if I don't know, or my answer is no on any one of those questions, when you look at Acts chapter 19, I should seriously consider being baptized again. You know, when we were here before, and 
in Muskogee and in Stillwater and in Hutchinson and Jefferson City. I can tell you many stories of people that were baptized again. Most of the time, it would take place in the afternoon or in the evening. But when we talk about being baptized again, let's remember that God doesn't want us to feel like we're amphibious. Sometimes if someone has fallen away from Jesus, they have fallen away and they have come back, sometimes they want to know, do I need to be baptized again? And the biblical answer is no. You don't need to be baptized again. You need to repent of what was done and you need to pray for forgiveness and God will willingly bestow it upon you. Amen. We also need to recognize on those questions, once again, that if we were baptized at a young age, if I understood I was a sinner and I understood what and who Jesus was and I understood that I wanted to give my life to him, that I'm just as saved as any adult or older teenager. Well, I want you to look at this next screen that I have up. Many of us in this room would have answered yes on that question, so those three questions I put up just a moment ago. The next step would be, if you said yes to those steps, where are you in your journey with Jesus Christ today? What and how are you being used by him in 2024 as opposed to the day you became a Christian and a child of the king and a believer? How are you allowing him to use you in this community and in this church and being a part of what we're seeking to do as his people? And here's the second application of the final one. We need to not only look in, but we need to look out. And we need to recognize that God wants us to look for one. This whole story started in Samaria. It started with Philip preaching to many people. But God wanted him to talk to one. In the end and I need to hear this the most, we're never in this for numbers' sake. We're in this for soul's sake. It's the attitude of just one more. Who in your family, who in your neighborhood, who in your workplace, who in your space can be brought to Jesus Christ? You know, as a church and as a group of believers, we want to be spending a lot of time with community, with the church. But we also need to be spending a lot of time in the community of Hinton and El Reno and Gary and Tuttle because people are only going to know about Jesus if we're there with them. We need to reach out to them. The final thing that I want to say is this. We live in a culture where some people don't know that they're headed for a Christless eternity. Maybe you're saying, what, what do you mean by that? Perfect example. When my brother and sister and I were growing up in LaPorte, Indiana, and I don't think my mom will mind me telling this, dad was at work and mom left my brother Sean at the local Kroger store, about six years old, just left him. <laughs> She did, and I don't know if, if we were misbehaving or if the groceries were on her mind. I don't know what happened. But it didn't hit her until we got home that we'd forgotten my brother. Well, she was ecstatic. We had to get back to save him. And do you know what? When we found Sean, he was in the manager's office drinking a Dr. Pepper and eating a candy bar. That's not the look that was on my mom's face when she saw him. And do you know what? My brother's smile and joy in his eyes turned into tears because he didn't know he was lost until he was found. <laughs> and the very same thing can happen to our family members and people that were around. They don't know that they're lost, that they're without Christ until they have been around us. Well, we opened our lesson by asking the question, who shared the gospel with you?
where did your baptism take place? I can't think of a better day that if you've not become a child of the king that you would make that decision today. And if you want to talk to someone after worship instead of coming up here in the front, will you talk to me? Will you call me? Will you text me? But it doesn't have to just be me. It could be any one person around us this morning. Maybe there's just someone else that needs to come back to Christ. Maybe there's one that has prayers of special concern. Whatever you need, come now as we stand and sing. Quickly in our are Shall we reap glory? Shall we reap tears? Into your hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste, let us carry God's precious message. Guiding the erring back to the right. Millions are groping without the gospel. Quickly they'll reach eternity's night. Shall we sit idly as a rush onward, haste, let us hold up Christ the true light. Into our hands the gospel is given, into our hands is given the precious message guiding the erring back to the right souls that are precious souls that are dying while we rejoice our sins are forgiven yet he not also die for these lost ones, then let us point the way unto heaven. Into our hands the gospel is given, into our hands is given the Precious message guiding the airing back to the right. Thank you, Jimmy Ray, for that good lesson. And I want to remind you, too, if you've not uh, received a bulletin yet, please get one on your way out. There's lots of announcements in there, upcoming uh, uh, showers and, and just all kinds of things happening. And um, one thing I do want to mention from the bulletin, well, two things, actually. Uh, remember this uh, sweet girl on the second page? Remington Hadrava gets to go to... Brazil, if she can raise the money. And this trip to Brazil is actually a mission trip. So lots of learning and lots of uh, productivity will result. And so if you can, by the way, we've helped her already with, uh, you have helped with your contribution. We have uh, allocated $1,000 for this trip. If you'd like to give individually, 
you may do that, uh, make donations payable to the Hinton Church of Christ if you're writing a check, or we might even put it in an envelope with the Hinton Church of Christ and give it to my friend Larry Baker. And he'll make sure that it gets to Remington. Um, and then uh, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, right? For when coffee time, the, the ladies' coffee time will be at Leilani's house. Uh, and that's 217 North Marion at 930. So not at 1L's uh, this week, but rather Leilani's. I've got three thank you notes that I uh, would like to read. Uh, church family, thank you very much for the beautiful flowers for Valentine's Day. I love them. That's from Robin. Hello, everyone, she says. This is from Shirley Ellis. So glad you send me cards and the kindness that you've shown in the things you say. I miss you all and pray you're all, you are all doing okay these days. God bless you all. Shirley Ellis. And this from Yvonne, Yvonne. Thank you to Jared for giving the obituary and loving remarks for Freddie. She says, to my church family, thank you once again for all your expressions of love in the loss of my Uncle Freddie. And thank you to those who came to the service to sing. Thank you. I love you, she says, Yvonne McGall. Sympathy is expressed to the Larry Baker family and, and the extended family on the loss of Jerry, his brother, Larry's brother, Jerry, and the services are pending. We also want to continue to remember Dennis and Beverly, they've had a rough week. meal right after lunch, uh, right after uh, services. We'll meet in the fellowship hall for a meal. And again, if you're visiting with us, please feel free to join us. And if you forgot to bring something, you forgot it was this fellowship day, uh, come anyway. There's always plenty. And the way this is going to happen, we're going to, Harvey's going to lead our closing prayer. And he's going to give thanks for the meal then. And then, then we'll have a closing song. Please don't leave after the prayer. <laughs> Unless you need more time to get to the fellowship hall. Then, then we'd love for you to go ahead and, and make your way up to the fellowship hall during the last song. And when you get there, be ready to be served. And you ladies that need to uh, go ahead and, and uh, leave then right after the prayer. Harvey Mead will lead us in a closing prayer. Won't you stand, please? For the song and the prayer, the prayer and the song. Let's pray together. Our dear God and our Father who art in heaven, Father, this has been a good morning. Father, we've had the privilege to be able to come here for Bible study, and we learned in our class about the man that was born blind. But Father, you gave him sight. You gave him physical sight, but Father, you also taught him and gave him a spiritual life. And Father, we know that each one of our teachers have worked hard this morning to be able to share your word with their students. And, and each one of the students could probably get up and say much the same thing that I've said. And Father, then to have the opportunity to uh, have Jimmy Ray present your lesson to us. Father, help us to remember that your word is so important. And Father, it's important that we live it within our life. Father, we want really the world to come to know you. We know our world would be so much better if they just had you and your son. And Father, we pray that you would help us to realize that, that we are the lights that can make the difference in somebody's life through your word. 
Father, this morning, it's been a good morning, and yet we're saddened because of individuals that have suffered a death, individuals that are concerned about their loved ones because of various illnesses. And Father, we just ask that you bless them, that they would know that you are with them and that they care about the problems that they are going through. And that, Father, that you will help them. And, Father, help us to help them. Father, this morning we also are privileged to be able to share a meal together. And, Father, it's so, it gives us so much joy to have fellowship with one another. And Father, we pray that you will bless those that have prepared this food and, and um, help them to realize that they are really working for you. And Father, we pray that each one of us will really use our life as a blessing for you because you bless us so bountifully much throughout our life. Father, we love you. We really want you to be first within our life. Father, we want others to see Christ in us. And Father, be with us as we, as we journey down through this week that we'll remember the lesson that Jimmy Ray has presented. In Jesus' name, amen. Everything to